Welcome to today's Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Falden. I'm uh, the organiser of Grand Rounds here in Dundee. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome today, in a virtual manner, uh, Prem Shekhar, who is a cardiac surgeon uh, in New England uh, and Associate Professor of Surgery at the Harvard Medical School. He was due to be visiting Dundee to visit family sometime, I think, in June or July. Um, and the plan was to try and tie uh, a grand round in with his visit to Dundee. But of course, um, we've, uh, everyone's plans have changed because of COVID. Um, so I was delighted when he agreed to still uh, do this talk, but from the comfort of his own home uh, in New England. And it is eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, so he's got up early and to give this presentation to, to us. So, so I'm, I'm very grateful. The, uh, I, I'm, Cardiac surgery is an, an interesting topic to us here in Dundee particularly because we don't have cardiac surgeons or, or thoracic surgeons for, uh, for that matter. Um, the, the history of this goes back many, many, many years um, where a decision had to be made of whether we had neurosurgery or cardiothoracic surgery here. And, and as you know, we have neurosurgeons and our cardiothoracic surgery goes to Edinburgh or to, uh, or to Aberdeen. So um, I, I'm always very interested to, to hear from cardiac and thoracic surgeons. Uh, and of course, it's particularly interesting to hear from people in different centers. Um, and there is, of course, on top of that, the issue of COVID and how COVID has affected uh, all that we do in medicine. And it's affected us in different ways and different specialities and certainly in different countries. So I hope that Prem is going to have a little word to say about uh, how COVID has affected them over in America. So enough from me, and I'll hand over to Prem, who's going to talk about cardiac surgery in New England. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you for this uh, kind invitation for me to uh, present at your Grand Rounds. Um, uh, thank you particularly to uh, Tom for uh, uh, organizing this and inviting me over, and uh, particular thanks uh, to my brother, uh, Kishore, uh, that you all know very well. Um, and uh, he was instrumental in organizing this as well. And as Tom mentioned, um, I was supposed to visit in person, but uh, other things got in the way. But I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, grand rounds and speak a little bit about our experiences um, in uh, New England and more particularly at my, at my institution about uh, cardiac surgery. Um, uh, as you can see, I am a, a cardiac surgeon at the Brigham and Women's. I've been there since 2004, and I'm an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I have no, uh, uh, no pertinent disclosures. So before I start, uh, Tom, do I have, how much time do I have? Well, well you have as much time as you like, but um, typically we, we finish by two. Oh, okay, good. Excellent. That'll work. So, um, so um, here we go. Um, so this, uh, this is a map of the United States uh, that shows uh, where New England is um, in the top right corner. Um, New England is the place where the settlers uh, first came from the United Kingdom. And uh, they landed uh, in this area and uh, they thought long and hard about uh, what they should name this area since they decided to leave the king and the queen and come over here. And after thinking for a long time, they decided that the best thing to call was New England. And they were, as you can see, quite creative in, um, in naming the new colony. But anyways, uh, that is New England in the top uh, right corner. It's um, known for its colonial past. It is known for its uh, uh, role in uh, the American Revolution. Uh, Benjamin Franklin um, belongs to Boston and uh, uh, it's known for our great sports teams, uh, among other things. Uh, we are also a, um, a, an academic uh, uh, hotspot uh, in the United States. Uh, and we, I mean, aside from California and a few other places across the US. So New England, as you can see on the right, is composed of uh, six states, uh, the state of Maine, the state of New Hampshire, the state of Vermont, state of uh, Connecticut, uh, the small state of Rhode Island there in the red, and of course the Commonwealth of uh, Massachusetts, where the city of Boston is the capital. And here's a picture of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Boston uh, to the, uh, on the coast there, 
and uh, the little uh, hook over here is the famous Cape Cod. Um, this is the Cape Cod Bay, uh, originally known for, of course, the cod, and we barely find any cod nowadays in Cape Cod, and the tragic reality of uh, overfishing. Uh, down here, two little islands, uh, the Nantucket Island and the Martha's Vineyard, um, uh, famous for their, um, for their, for the residences of the Kennedys. And more recently, uh, former President Barack Obama has a large, uh, uh, large residence uh, at the Martha's Vineyard. And to the right is the famous uh, Boston skyline, um, the Longfellow Bridge in the front. And uh, as you can see, we're uh, not really known for our tall buildings, uh, uh, but um, um, this is a view from Cambridge looking in towards uh, Boston. Um, as, as you all know, uh, uh, the, the, the the first hospital in uh, New England and uh, one of the first hospitals in the United States was actually the Massachusetts General Hospital at the, uh, in Boston. And, um, and the second institution that came to be in Boston was what is called the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, which is the uh, parent institution of what um, is Brigham and Women's Hospital today. And this was built in uh, the late 1800s. And this is a picture from the past. Um, as you can see, the main hospital is over here to the right and connected by this corridor to a bunch of wards over to the left there. And most of them built in a sanatorium like um, uh, in a structure uh, because um, the mechanism of management of medical patients back in the early 1900s was a little different. It uh, relied more on love and fresh air than medicine as we do today. But uh, this is how it was in early 1900s. And uh, over time, uh, oh yeah, this silhouette at the back here, this big building here is the Harvard Medical School, which is just behind our hospital. And on the street behind the Harvard Medical School was the Boston Lying In Hospital, which was the women's hospital. So we, com we joined forces with the Boston Lying In Hospital and also another hospital in town called the Robert Breck Brigham Hospital and together formed the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So that's why it's a very strange name. Uh, it's a little difficult to explain to everyone why it's called the Brigham and Women's Hospital. That mostly is because we were combined with a women's hospital to make this current institution. This is how it looks today. Um, on the left, as you can see, the original structure still exists. Um, this is the building that we saw in the previous um, picture. And then these two arms, they are still there from, from the 1800s. They are renovated, of course. And the Harvard Medical School in the background over here and the Harvard Medical School in the foreground as, uh, to the right. And uh, the rest of it is all changed. So this is uh, what uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital looks like today. Uh, to the right are the old buildings. We have this little clover shaped tower, which was built in the 1970s. Uh, houses all our medical and surgical specialties. Uh, this building here is the Centers for Women's, Center for Women's Health, which has our OBGYN facilities. And across from this, um, um, these old buildings on the right to the left are the two new buildings. Uh, the one in the front is the cardiovascular center with 250 beds that opened in 2007, houses cardiology, cardiac surgery, and vascular surgery. This is where I work uh, as a cardiac surgeon. And behind that, this uh, sort of uh, uniquely shaped building is, um, called the Hale Center for Transformative Medicine that actually houses neurology, neurosurgery, sports medicine, and uh, various uh, clinical labs. The building of transformative medicine uh, was uh, opened about three years ago. So that's the newest building on campus. So this is the um, Brigham and Women's Hospital in, um, in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, my, my place of work, including fellowship, uh, coming on almost 20 years now. So the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, famously in the world of heart surgery is known for having been the center that performed the first heart surgery um, 
in America and indeed possibly the first heart operation in the world. So in May of 1923, this, this guy on the left uh, performed this operation in the middle using this tool on the right on this young woman at the bottom and then wrote about it in this little article at the bottom right. So this gentleman is Elliot Carr Cutler. Uh, he was the second chairman of surgery at the Brigham and Women's, a famous World War I surgeon. Uh, his, um, his boss was Harvey Cushing of the Cushing syndrome um, fame and uh, allowed Elliot Cutler to enter the world of um, heart surgery. And of course, at that time, uh, the world was ravaged with rheumatic uh, heart disease. And uh, this, uh, this instrument is called the Cutler's valvulotome, has a small knife here, and that is inserted through the apex of the left ventricle and using uh, a finger in the left atrial appendage, you know, uh, using tactile coordination in your brain, uh, this valvulotome is used to split the mitral valve and thereby relieve mitral stenosis. And this young lady was the recipient of the first operation, uh, did very well and went on to live another four decades after that. Um, and this was, of course, published by Elliot Cutler and Samuel Levine in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which is the precursor to the famous New England Journal of Medicine. Elliot Cutler went on to do a few more of these operations, but unfortunately had more mortality than he was comfortable with and actually gave up on it uh, for several years. Um, and it was ultimately revived by the gentleman on the left, who is Dwight Harkin. So Dwight is a famous World War II surgeon who came to start the division of thoracic surgery at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in 1946 and remained uh, the chief until 1970. But the actual uh, development of cardiac surgery at the Brigham goes to the two gentle uh, credit goes to the two gentlemen on the right. Uh, Jack Collins in the middle and Dr. Lawrence Cohn, my mentor uh, to the right. Um, they both came to the Brigham in uh, 1970 and 1971 and brought in the world of cardiac surgery to the Brigham and Women's Hospital, both giants in their field. Larry Cohn is uh, more notoriously known because uh, he was very visible on the national and international stage particularly in the management of valvular heart disease. So we've been at it for about uh, 50 years now and, uh, and have done pretty well for ourselves. Uh, Jack was the division chief from 1970 to 1985 and Larry Cohn was from 1985 to 2005. So they, they ran the institution for almost 40 years between each other. So the Brigham Cardiac Surgery has several milestones. Uh, of course, 1923, we did the first mitral valve operation in the world. And of course, uh, Dwight Harkin is the person who picked up from uh, Elliot Carr Cutler's work and um, went on to do a lot of uh, stenotic mitral valve surgery and published a series in 1948. Harkin also went on to do the first valve replacement using a ball and cage valve. We'll see that in a minute. And among other things, we were the first in New England to um, use um, uh, heterografts and homographs. Uh, we also, along with the Cleveland Clinic, were one of the few institutions that started minimally, minimally invasive valve surgery in 1996. And of course, we were a big part of the transcatheter valve program. And, uh, and to date, we have performed over uh, 30, to 1,400 transcatheter valve procedures. Uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital is also very well known for its name in transplantation with Murray having performed the first kidney transplantation in the 1950s uh, for uh, an operation for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize. So we have, we have a presence in the world of transplant, um, although the first heart transplant in America was done by uh, Norm Shumway at Stanford. We were the first to do the first heart and lung transplants in uh, New England and Massachusetts. And we were also very active in the world of ventricular assist devices and multi multiple organ transplantations. 
So in 2004, we celebrated 50 years of transplantation, starting with uh, Joseph Murray's first transplant. And in 2005, we had finished 500 heart transplants. I think the count is now coming up on over 800 uh, heart transplants. So, um, you know, to, Tom had asked me to speak about uh, where cardiac surgery is today um, in general and what we do um, at uh, the Brigham and Women's. And I thought I would break this up into uh, a few parts. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, where coronary artery bypass grafting surgery is today, valvular disease, aneurysm disease, mechanical support and heart transplantation for advanced heart disease and, uh, and a brief chat about genetic cardiovascular diseases and what we're doing about that. So coronary artery bypass grafting surgery is uh, probably one of the more prolific and um, uh, oldest operations that have been done continuously in cardiac surgery. So the origins of uh, coronary bypass surgery goes well back in time but as it exists today, it came to be in the 1960s with the work of uh, Dr. Kolosov in the USSR and Dr. Favolaro at the Cleveland Clinic. So for a long time, uh, coronary artery bypass grafting surgery was mostly an operation that involved taking saphenous veins from the leg and uh, constructing bypasses to uh, various blocked arteries of the heart. And indeed, um, the story goes that um, uh, most of the most of the coronary bypass surgeries that were done in the old days, which is in the late 60s and 70s, were mostly single and double vein bypasses only, and of course that we have come a long way from that. Uh, coronary bypass surgery has always been limited by the um, durability of the saphenous vein grafts, with uh, the 10-year uh, freedom from disease in the vein graft being less than 30 percent. And the world of coronary bypass grafting surgery changed dramatically when uh, people started to use the left internal mammary artery as a conduit. The left internal mammary artery has, was actually one of the first conduits used in um, the evolution of uh, coronary bypass surgery, but uh, saphenous vein ended up uh, taking its place because it was just more convenient. But eventually left internal mammary artery came back um, as a conduit and uh, over the years has been shown to be the one bypass that actually has the greatest prognostic benefit uh, in terms of freedom from reoperation and also um, uh, benefit in, uh, in long-term survival. The left internal mammary artery uh, for a variety of histological reasons uh, related to its media and its uh, intima is uh, less prone to spasm. It is also less prone to atherosclerotic disease and also um, has some natural um, uh, tendency to uh, secrete nitric oxide and thereby making it a very good conduit. And we have stories about how this internal mammary artery remains patent for over three decades in some individuals. So um, this has really changed the world of coronary bypass surgery and the use of left internal mammary artery as a conduit along with vein grafts is the standard operation uh, in coronary artery um, surgery today. The world of coronary artery surgery uh, had its first uh, sort of um, uh, impact by the advent of per percutaneous coronary intervention in the, in the late 1980s when Andreas Grunzig first did the balloon angioplasty. So POBA, that is on my slide, is called the plain old balloon angioplasty where you know a, a, a balloon catheter was uh, placed into a coronary artery coming up from the femoral and the balloon was used to dilate an occlusion. Um, this had a high failure rate and in the early days had a high rupture rate making for a lot of emergency surgery, but that was quickly uh, alleviated by the use of uh, stents and that would be, um, you know, after after balloon dilatation, put a little metallic jacket to support the expand uh, newly opened artery. And um, the original bare metal stents uh, were very successful, reduced the rate of reocclusion, but the reocclusion rate was at least up to 30% um, in bare metal stents. And of course, now 
we have moved on to what we call the drug eluting stents, uh, and there are several, several iterations of that. And now the um, restenosis rate uh, with the use of drug eluting stents is about 5%. Um, but the world of uh, both uh, coronary artery bypass grafting surgery and percutaneous coronary intervention received its biggest jolt when the medical management of coronary artery disease actually caught up. And indeed, the medical management of coronary artery disease with the use of beta blockers, with the use of um, angiotensin um, receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors, the aggressive use of statins and, um, and aspirin has actually made coronary artery disease into a stable chronic condition that you can actually manage a lot of them with medical therapy without needing um, uh, aggressive intervention and, uh, and some part of this was actually uh, shown in the very recent ischemia trial. So the uh, world of interventions in, co in coronary artery disease, be it percutaneous coronary intervention or surgical intervention has actually declined over time. And in our institution, in our heyday, we used to perform six to 800 coronary bypass uh, operations and today we do just 300. So coronary artery bypass grafting today still exists, although various cardiologists have threatened us over time that we would need to find a new job because they were either going to stent it or medically treat it, but uh, neither has proven to be true. And coronary artery surgery still exists and, uh, and has a role to play in the management of coronary artery disease. And one of the more important things that has happened recently is the use of the syntax score and this was developed by researchers in the Netherlands. And uh, the syntax score basically calculates the burden of coronary artery disease uh, by scoring uh, the number of blockages, the scoring the complexity of the blockages. So the higher the syntax score, the less durable is going to be the percutaneous coronary intervention and the more successful is uh, surgery going to be. So. Syntax has basically defined which patients need, uh, need stents and which patients actually need uh, coronary surgery. Uh, one, of the great, uh, one of the leading voices in the balance between percutaneous coronary intervention and uh, coronary bypass surgery has been David Taggart, who is uh, from um, Oxford and works at the John Ratcliffe Hospital um, in your country. And of course, the role of coronary bypass surgery in um, patients who have diabetes and left ventricular dysfunction is well known. More recently, coronary surgery has um, expanded to the use of uh, multi-arterial bypasses with the use of the right mammary, radial arteries, and gastroepiploic arteries. And uh, we, it has been shown that the more arterial grafts that you use vis-a-vis -vis, um, one artery with multiple veins, uh, the more arterial bypasses you use, um, uh, the longer you will get uh, in terms of freedom from reoperation and freedom from symptoms. Uh, so doing uh, multi-arterial bypasses is more or less the norm, um, especially in, uh, in the younger patients, uh, less than 65 or 70 years of age. Um, Off-pump and on-pump coronary surgery has been a long debated topic and uh, off-pump being uh, performing coronary surgery on a beating heart, on-pump being the use of the cardiopermy bypass machine and stopping the heart. Uh, this remains a debate. Uh, however, the world has moved more in the direction of on-pump coronary bypass surgery because no trial has really shown great benefit of one over the other. And uh, indeed, it is much easier to perform on-pump coronary bypass surgery, and the number of bypasses performed per patient is actually higher when you use the on-pump technique. And of course, uh, surgery in um, coronary artery disease is also important when you need endarterectomies for complex um, coronary lesions, and also in the rare instance that we need to use a transmyocardial laser to uh, to offer benefit to patients who have non-graftable uh, coronary arteries. So that is where we stand today in terms of coronary artery bypass grafting. It still has a role to play, and, um, but a much uh, smaller role and a much more defined role, um, and it will continue to be that way um, for decades to come. 
Moving on to valvular heart disease, um, talking about valve replacement first. Um, in, this, in the 1960s, a uh, uh, gentleman over here, Albert Starr, developed this uh, ball and cage valve where this ball would move up and down to open and close a particular valve to allow forward flow. And uh, this remained um, the centerpiece of valve replacement for at least a decade. And before this came along, which was the single leaflet uh, tilting disc valve. The problem with the ball and cage valve was uh, one, it was too noisy, two, it was too large and bulky, and three, uh, it re really needed a very high dose of uh, anticoagulation. And it had several other mechanical issues um, that led to the development of a lower profile valve um, on the top right, which is a single leaflet tilting disc valve. But um, very soon um, in the mid 80s, we were, we moved over to this bi-leaflet tilting disc valve, uh, which we use even today. Uh, basically, all of this uh, is um, uh, a titanium ring and pyrolytic carbon uh, discs. As you can see, there are two discs and uh, they open uh, nearly right angles and allow for laminar flow through the valve. A lot of credit uh, to the development of this valve uh, goes to uh, uh, Walt Lillehei, surgeon at uh, University of Minnesota, who first uh, developed this valve. And believe it or not, uh, the idea for the bi-leaflet tilting disc valve, which is used today widely and has been for the last four decades, actually came out of um, somebody looking at a trash can in a lot of detail. And if you remember, there are trash cans that have two, uh, two, set, two openings uh, that, uh, that look exactly like that. So it's amazing how the, some of the more brilliant ideas come from the most uh, simplest observations. And of course, um, over time, um, replacement for valvular um, heart disease has also moved into the world of uh, heterografts and homographs and what we use today uh, along the top, uh, left to right, uh, are um, um, the bovine pericardial valves here. These are internally mounted. The frame is on the outside and these are externally mounted where the bovine pericardium is actually wrapped around the um, uh, frame. And there are some unique benefits to these two constructs that we use in specific patients. To the upper right here is a porcine valve. Uh, this valve is actually constructed from aortic valve leaflets uh, from the pig, but it is not the pig's valve itself. I mean, each leaflet is specifically selected from different pigs and it is, uh, it is uh, hand sewn and constructed that way. Compared to what is in the bottom uh, to the left is the entire porcine aortic root itself. So this actually belongs to one pig. And it is the valve plus the proximal portion of the aorta called the aortic root with the porcine coronary arteries having been tied off. And in patients that need a biological root replacement for a combination of aortic valve disease and um, uh, a root aneurysm, this is what is used. And to the right here is, this is the cadaveric homograft, uh, uh, a human homograft. So uh, this, um, this was uh, very um, prominent in use in the 1990s because um, these uh, top um, uh, bovine and porcine bioprosthesis did not have the longevity that we desired and we used a lot of the homograph, but as these prostheses have become more and more durable, the hues of the homograft has actually receded. And we use the homographs as a, as a conduit or as a valve in treating patients with endocarditis, because uh, when we use a homograft, it is completely biological material and there is no synthetic material. And in the world of endocarditis, that is of great advantage to prevent reinfections of um, newly implanted valves. So that's what we have for valve replacements uh, for um, uh, prosthesis. And when do we do uh, valve replacement? And uh, of course, uh, we, all know, we all know for the four valves, the aortic, mitral, tricuspid, and pulmonic valves. 
Uh, the most common indications for replacement are calcific disease, either related to senile calcification or early calcification of deformed valves like bicuspid or unicuspid aortic valves and other such conditions on the mitral valve. And of course, rheumatic disease usually renders the valve not repairable. And uh, these are the two common reasons why we replace the aortic and uh, mitral valves. Carcinoid disease, at least in our institution, remains uh, an important indication for valvular replacement. Uh, the 5-HT that goes from the bowel and the liver across the right heart destroys the tricuspid and pulmonic valves and, um, and usually not amenable to repair. And we end up doing a lot of tricuspid and pulmonary valve replacements for patients with stable carcinoid disease. And in rare instances, uh, myxomatous disease, we do a valve replacement when they are not repairable, particularly in the mitral position. So really the choices are uh, between mechanical and biological valves um, uh, for most locations. And um, the current thinking for the aortic valve really is that, uh, so the, really the big, um, uh, the big difference between mechanical and biological valves are the mechanical valves are durable almost for life. Um, the structural failure of a mechanical valve is extraordinarily rare, but unfortunately mechanical valves uh, do bring um, uh, the need for anticoagulation um, and that is something that people have to subscribe for life, uh, involves INR measurements and also um, the issues related to being on long-term uh, anticoagulation therapy. Um, the biological valves, on the other hand, uh, do not need anticoagulation therapy after three months, but, um, but they do have a limited um, longevity because uh, of the biological tissue that degrades over time uh, most biological valves in the aortic position uh, last no more than 15 years, and most biological valves in the mitral position last no more than um, 10 or 12 years. The biological valves do have a higher longevity in the tricuspid and pulmonic positions, and this is largely ascribed to the fact that it is a low pressure system and the um, stresses on the valve is lower in the tricuspid and pulmonic positions because it's on the right side of the heart. So the recommendations nowadays are uh, for the aortic valve, we are inclined to recommend a mechanical valve uh, be, be under the age of 50 and strongly recommend a biological valve over the age of 65. And in the mitral, uh, the line is uh, 50 for mechanical and greater than 70 for biological for obvious issues related to durability and anticoagulation. But however, at all times, uh, the choice of valve actually remains the choice of the patient uh, because it is the, um, it is the decision of um, the impact that long-term anticoagulation is going to have on their lives that they even we have younger patients decide to go with biological valves and they decide to take a chance with the second procedure later on in life. For the tricuspid and pulmonic valves, because of the, because of the relative longevity of the biologics, we usually go with biological valves. Um, and uh, they are easily accessible now by transcatheter technologies and there is a particular problem with putting mechanical valves, particularly in the tricuspid position, because the amount of anticoagulation needed is very high because, uh, because of the low pressure system. So in the tricuspid and pulmonic valves, the bias is more towards using biologics. Uh, and rarely do we use uh, mechanicals, and we use mechanicals, at least I use mechanicals, mostly in patients who have active carcinoid disease. In patients who have active carcinoid disease, the 5-HD can actually destroy a biological valve just as fast as it can destroy a native valve. So that is one of the reasons where, where we do use a mechanical valve in the tricuspid position and deal with the consequences of, um, of anticoagulation at a high dose. 
As far as mitral, uh, as far as the mitral valve is concerned, um, the most common disease that we see in the first world nowadays is myxomatous mitral valve disease, where we have either ruptured cords of the mitral valve here, where I'm pointing, or some sort of a complex ruptured cord or um, um, uh, instability of the commissure of the mitral valve um, producing mitral valve regurgitation. And this is the most common thing that we see here as it relates to the mitral valve. And over the years, mitral valve repair has become the standard of care. And to the left here, we see a standard mitral valve procedure where there is a ruptured cord in the P2 segment of the posterior leaflet, which is treated by a quadrangular resection, mobilization, and primary midline repair. And everything is supported by a ring around the valve called an annuloplasty band. To the right here, we see a complex repair called a commissuroplasty and stabilization and that renders the mitral valve competent. So indeed, um, performing mitral valve replacement for myxomatous mitral valve disease is a rare thing nowadays. And at the Brigham and Women's for patients with mitral valve, uh, myxomatous mitral valve disease, over 85% of these patients get mitral valve repairs and very seldom do we end up with a replacement. And mostly that is because of advanced myxomatous disease. My mentor, Dr. Cohn, was a big proponent of uh, mitral valve repair, and he's the one that brought it into the hospital and made it into what it is today. And we perform, a, you know, we do about 1,100 heart operations a year, and about 400 of them, four or 500 of them are valvular heart disease, either aortic or mitral valves. As far as access to surgery is concerned, um, the traditional access is with midline sternotomy approach going down the middle, uh, whereas nowadays we do minimally invasive mitral valve. Sir, my, this incision over here, the upper sternotomy, is for minimally invasive aortic valve surgery. And these incisions, um, the minimally invasive lower hemisternotomy and also a right thoracotomy approach is used for uh, both uh, managing mitral and uh, tricuspid valve surgery. So both the mitral and the tricuspid valves are easily accessible from the right side of the patient. And, uh, and these are the two uh, minimally invasive techniques that we follow for mitral and tricuspid valve surgery. They have the both, all these minimally invasive techniques have the benefit of uh, uh, faster recovery, less pain, less bleeding, and earlier return to work and earlier discharge from the hospital. Um, the world of valvular heart disease has been transformed by transcatheter therapies and uh, TAVR, or as in, in Europe known as TAVI, um, is now the stand uh, is one of the options that are available. And the two most popular valves is the Edwards Sapien valve on the left and the Medtronic core valve on the right. And these are bovine pericardial valves mounted inside a nitinol frame. And of course, uh, the two um, ways of delivery are um, on the left, a transfemoral delivery where it comes up from the femoral artery, turns around the arch and the valve is deployed into the inside the native aortic valve using balloon technology and the nitinol being a self-expanding um, um, uh, self expanding metal, uh, hold the radial forces of the nitinol hold the valve in place. On the right is uh, something that we do less and less nowadays is a transapical approach to uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So various trials were, cons uh, were, were done over the last uh, decade. We started with high risk patients, moved on to intermediate risk patients, and then moved on to low risk patients. And currently in the United States, um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement is recommended and approved I would say approved for uh, almost all patients uh, from uh, low risk all the way to inoperable. And indeed, uh, this has changed the um, world of aortic valve surgery in a big way. Particular importance to where it is not indicated, um, it requires a certain scaffolding of calcium uh, in order to hold the valve in place. So in patients who have pure aortic valve insufficiency, it, it you really cannot do 
a uh, transcatheter valve because of the lack of calcium. Um, if you have a bicuspid or a unicuspid valve with sort of eccentric calcification, or you have other associated diseases like an ascending aortic aneurysm or an aortic root aneurysm, uh, this becomes less appealing and uh, the risk of perivalvular leaks are quite high and it is used very carefully in patients with these conditions. There are certain other anatomic reasons why a TAVR is not, may not be possible related to access from the groin or other locations. And also the relative um, location of the coronary arteries with respect to the aortic valve. If the coronary arteries are too low, uh, TAVR cannot be performed because the risk of coronary occlusion is quite high. As a rule, we tend to uh, gravitate away from uh, transcatheter valves in patients who are very young because uh, these are biological valves and will also fail uh, over time. So even today, the very young patients are still uh, actively considered for surgery rather than TAVR, which remains restricted to the older population. And as, as I said before, uh, TAVR has impacted uh, the number of aortic valve replacements that we do. Our practice has been cut in half because the other half are going to TAVR. But um, the TAVR remains an untested, uh, uh, it's been, well, it remains t partially tested for 10 years and there is some concern about the long-term durability being lower than a surgical valve and also uh, if we put a, start putting these valves in the 50s and 60 year olds, uh, we will have to at some point in the future, go ahead and take all of this out when it becomes impossible to do more TV, TAVRs one inside the other. Uh, so we are anticipating that the pendulum will swing just like it did with coronary surgery, but it will, it will take its time. And uh, again, TAVR will continue to be, will, it, will end up being sort of one of the, um, uh, options in, in valvular treatment. A uh, brief talk about uh, where, where transcatheter mitral valve technology lies. This is called a mitral valve clip. Uh, and as you can see in the pictures, it clips the mitral valve in the center to prevent mitral valve regurgitation. And this is currently approved only for high risk patients that uh, are not suitable for open surgery. And there are some other trials underway to look at this technology in patients with heart failure. Transcatheter mitral valve replacements are coming in a big way. And these are some of the pictures of the various technologies. And we are actually in the trial that is testing this one in the top right called the intrepid valve. And again, these are catheter-based uh, mitral valve replacement technologies uh, that are coming through and hopefully will uh, come to be commonplace in about 10 years when the entire cycle of all the trials run through. A quick note about aneurysm surgery and where we are with that. Uh, we as at the Brigham are, um, we are a low volume aneurysm center, but the world of thoracoabdominal aneurysms changed in a big way um, with, the, uh, uh, with the advent of transcatheter technologies. And on the left, you see how an aneurysm is treated using a catheter-based deployment of a graft. But what is happening in several centers is what's happening in the right, where we are using fenestrated stent grafts and multi-branched stent grafts, where you can actually get very creative and uh, deploy um, other grafts through the original graft in order to accommodate the branches. And this is where the world of aneurysm surgery is going. And it's a very exciting world and a technically very challenging world as well. We do, we do less of this at the Brigham, but uh, something I thought we, I should share with you. And uh, finally, to uh, close with uh, where we are with mechanical circulatory support um, in the world of advanced heart disease, you know, after several trials um, and uh, various iterations, this was the first uh, durable mechanical support that we came up with, a company called Thoratec, which is now um, owned by Abbott. But uh, these, these blood sacs or blood pumps used to actually sit outside the patient. They would exit out of these little holes here and sit outside the patient in the left ventricular assist device going from the apex of the left ventricle to the aorta on the right, going from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery, 
very durable pumps, but the problem was they used to hang outside the patient. They had this elect electrical console that was the size of a refrigerator and a lot of infection related to these exit lines. And they gave way to what became intracorporeal devices. And the one on the left is the original one, which used to actually sit in the abdomen. It was the size of, um, I don't know, a small uh, disc and it occupied a lot of space in the abdomen. But again, uh, left ventricular apex to the aorta. This was a pulsatile pump, very durable, but again, same issues with infection and uh, space requirements. Eventually moved to a smaller pump, an axial flow pump called the uh, HeartMate 2, which used to sit in the abdomen just below the diaphragm. And now we use this magnetically levitated pump called the HeartMate 3, which actually sits completely within the pericardium. And as you can see on the right, uh, a small little drive line comes out connected to a, a controller that is then connected to a battery pack that runs this, um, runs this thing. So where are we with mechanical support? Um, um, initially started off with a bridge to transplant, but nowadays we use it as a bridge to recovery um, in patients who have recoverable heart disease from myocarditis and also now we are using, as it becomes more durable, we are using it as destination therapy in patients who are not candidates for transplantation. Te temporary mechanical circulatory support is also uh, come up in a big way. Uh, balloon pump was came up a long time ago, but we have this short-term mechanical support systems, which we use for short-term support and also catheter-based mechanical support, as I've shown in the pictures here. This is an impeller device that comes up from the groin across the aorta, across the aortic valve and sits this way and basically augments the, takes over the function of the left ventricle by picking up blood here and using an axial flow system to pump it into the, into the um, uh, aorta. So this is used for temporary support and sometimes used to conduct um, uh, highly complex catheter-based procedures like angioplasty of the left main coronary artery, et cetera. Uh, or other complicated procedures in patients with bad ventricles where temporary support is required to facilitate um, the procedure itself. And of course, there is the world of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, which is used for cardiac support or cardiopulmonary support as is appropriate. A uh, quick word on heart transplantation. Um, uh, Christian Bernard and uh, Norm Shumway, um, we can go back and forth about who did it in the first place, but um, not much has changed in the technique, technique of, uh, uh, of how heart transplantation is done, but what has changed is uh, changes in procurement. And this organ care system that I sh I've shown on the right has actually transformed the world of transplantation in a big way, particularly in Australia and Europe. And, um, and this can actually increase the organ preservation time in a big way. We are currently running trials in the United States and uh, has shown great promise. As far as surgery and other things are concerned, uh, protection strategies are better. There is better immunology to identify the donors more accurately. There is more patholo There's better pathology to identify rejection earlier so that we can do aggressive therapies to protect the uh, allograft as best as we can. And at the Brigham, we actually wrote a seminal paper recently about using hepatitis C donors um, for heart transplantation uh, with the idea, I mean, after uh, specific um, uh, therapies for hepatitis C became available, um, we would use hepatitis C donors. And in case the recipient became hepatitis C positive, we would treat them with uh, antiviral therapies. So we have expanded the donor pool using some novel ideas, and that continues to be something where we will continue to work. Finally, last comment, something that I pursue uh, is surgery for aortic and mitral valve disease in connective tissue disease like Marfan's and Lois Dietz, where we do the aortic valve sparing, aortic root surgery and mitral valve surgery, and also septal muscle reduction in patients who have medically refractory um, and hemodynamically significant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So uh, before I end, um, no, sir, no presentation in uh, 
cardiac surgery is complete without a little blood and guts for people to see. So this is a patient with um, aortic root aneurysm in Marfan's syndrome. Um, and uh, going to have an aortic valve sparing aortic root replacement. Uh, this is an echocardiogram of the same patient. And of course, um, so this is a standard midline sternotomy approach uh, to the condition, a little saw going over there. And this is the heart in its uh, glory. As you can see, the aneurysm is restricted to the proximal ascending aorta and the aortic root. We've heparinized the patient. Uh, we are now inserting an aortic cannula, and this will be the arterial inflow. This is the venous cannula that will drain the venous blood into the heart-lung machine, and this will be the circuit, the venous blood going to the heart-lung machine, getting oxygenated, and coming back to the arterial cannula. This is a coronary perfusion uh, system that we are placing in place so that myocardial protection can be achieved as we do the operation. Um, so we use um, anti-grade and retrograde um, protection technique. So here we are, the heart is arrested and uh, the aortic root is being dissected. You can see the aortic valve uh, below, completely normal, uh, but there is a giant aneurysm above. At the moment, the aneurysm is being excised. And um, I'll have to move this along a little faster so that we you know, don't run out of time. So here we are developing the coronary buttons. This is the left coronary button, has to be isolated and developed uh, so that this can be implanted into the graft. Um, and now we've sort of excised the whole uh, aneurysm and uh, the top of the commissure of the aortic valve is being anchored and identified, the valve being examined. So this is the left button here, this is the right coronary button there, and the valve down here. So, oh, oh boy. So the, uh, the aneurysm is developed all the way to the aortic root. Um, oh man. And then um, we place multiple subannular sutures. And then we select uh, this graft, which is a valsalva graft. Uh, as you can see, the rings go horizontally at the bottom and the top and go vertically uh, in the center there. And that vertical orientation is where the graft expands to mimic the sinuses of Valsalva. Um, so this is sort of uh, implanted down and, um, and the commissural posts are tied in place. And eventually the entire valve is uh, re-implanted into the inside of that valve salva segment. And now this is a completion of the operation where we have a synthetic graft going all the way down to the root. And the valve is actually sewn into the inside of this graft using a continuous running proline. And uh, this is how we see it on the outside and more of the same, and um, we test it to make sure that the valve is competent, and once that is uh, determined, we then go ahead and sew the coronary button. This is the left coronary button that is being sewn onto a small hole that is made um, in the sinus segment. This is the same thing happening to the right side. The right coronary button is being sewn to the graft, and eventually, uh, the graft is then sewn to the uh, mid-ascending aorta where the aneurysm ended. So this is something that is a very cool operation to do, an aortic valve sparing root replacement, uh, very commonly done in patients who have connective tissue disease like um, Marfan's or Lois Dietz, and is a big part of my practice. 
So um, here you go. Um, heart is heart is beating, and over time we will get the heart off the heart lung machine, and um, the operation will be complete. So that ends my presentation about cardiac surgery, and um, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Or um, if Tom, if uh, I think we are very close to the end of time here, um, if you want me to say a couple of words about COVID, I'm happy to do so. But um, Otherwise, I can do whatever uh, you would desire. Thanks very much, Prem. That's really fascinating stuff. Um, and uh, I'm, very, I'm always very interested in the history of medicine. And I, I really appreciated your first few minutes there about, uh, uh, about the history of, of the hospitals up in New England. Now, John Irving, who's one of our cardiologists here, has a question for you, if he can turn his mic on. There we go. Hi, thanks. Thanks very much for the outlining the state of the art. I was interested as to whether um, COVID led to change in patient management in Boston. Um, so in Scotland, we were able to send our patients for cardiac surgery throughout the the, the recent phase of the pandemic, but in other centres in England, um, the, they had zero access to cardiac surgery, and there was a lot more complex uh, intervention going on. How, how was it in Boston and, and how did you work your way through that? So starting, uh, starting in late uh, March, all the way to uh, the beginning of May, cardiac surgery was uh, elective and uh, semi-urgent heart surgery was basically on hold. And we only did uh, um, you know, emergent and urgent surgery, uh, which would be dissections, which would be unstable coronary artery disease, endocarditis and transplantation. So that is all we did. So our uh, work was almost cut into less than, uh, less than a quarter of what we do. And that was by active design because um, at, at, at one time in the peak of the pandemic, almost all our intensive care units were filled with uh, COVID-19 patients. So we really didn't, we had more, more or less one and a half functioning ICUs for everybody else. So we had to suspend, um, um, you know, um, cardiac surgery that could be safely suspended. And since the middle of May, we've restarted, we got through the backlog and uh, now we are back to being fully functional. Fortunately in cardiac surgery, we were able to, um, uh, prioritize them correctly, and we we conducted several routine checks on them every week to make sure that that they were doing okay. And we, in our population at the Brigham, did not lose any patients uh, because we delayed their operation. So we were lucky that way. But that was more or less the experience all across Boston that. Um, um, the MGH, the Brigham, Tufts Medical Center, everybody uh, were literally swamped. And at one time we had over, I think almost 175 patients in intensive care and virtually, I mean, cardiac, we were the first ones thrown out of our ICU. Um, and, uh, and eventually a lot of people got evicted as well. And the entire cardiovascular center became one big ICU. Thanks very much. Got another question from Kathy McWilliam, who's one of our clinical geneticists. She'd like to ask you uh, about connective tissue disorders. Hi, thanks for the very interesting talk there. Um, I have an uh, interest in Lois Dietz syndrome and Marfan syndrome, and was really interested to see the video that you'd put there. Is there any way you can describe, and I know this is very niche for everybody else that might be on the call, what, what sort of difficulties do you find when you're operating on particularly the low-state patients? Um, from, a, from a technical standpoint, uh, they are uh, no different uh, than anybody else. I mean, aside from the abnormal tissue uh, related to the aneurysm, the rest of the tissue is pretty, pretty robust and there are not real technical difficulties that we encounter. But what we have, I mean, they, of course, as you know, uh, the bar is different for uh, indications for surgery. In, in Marfan's, we tend to recommend surgery once they get to five centimeters and start moving ahead. But in Lois Dietz, we find that the rate of rupture, spontaneous rupture and spontaneous dissections can occur at lower sizes at four and a half centimeters and sometimes even at four centimeters in patients who have very aggressive uh, disease. So 
the challenge really is to accurately identify these people and uh, accurately identify patients who actually have a very strong family history of aortic catastrophes and get to them um, uh, before uh, you know, they get past the point where their family members actually had a dissection or a rupture. But from a technical standpoint, uh, it is not a, it's, there is nothing, you know, uh, friable or fragile or anything about them. They're actually young people and fairly, in fairly good health otherwise. But the uh, technique of doing uh, a valve preservation operation in aortic root disease uh, and doing a mitral valve preservation operation in Marfan's patients who have mitral valve disease is, is nuanced, is technically challenging, and yes, it is uh, a sort of a niche procedure that is not widely performed by all surgeons. You're right about that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Fran, I wonder if you, you could just say a, a, a few words about COVID and the impact it's had on, on your practice uh, and, and just perhaps what the what your feelings are uh, as a medical community on how COVID has uh, has gone in America and and the approaches that have that that have uh, have either worked or haven't. Right. I mean, as you as you well know, I mean, we stand out as one of the countries that has done a really terrible job with the with the pandemic. I mean, uh, that's a well known fact. Uh, uh, without getting into the politics of it. Uh, <laughs> and our fearless leader, um, um, you know, we've, we've had a rough ride. So to date, um, we have had, uh, the, the state of Massachusetts uh, has about 8 million people and we have had uh, 110,000 confirmed cases and uh, we've had about 8,000 deaths. Um, uh, oh, and. Uh, and this all this happened between late March and mid May, and uh, since uh, since the middle of May, uh, now we are actually on a downslope. And uh, the newly reported cases yesterday uh, were were only about 300, and uh, the newly reported deaths was only about 20. So we're we're not completely out of the hole, but uh, we are much better than our peak where we had thousands of cases being confirmed each day and over a hundred mortalities each day for several, uh, for several days in, in the peak of the pandemic. Uh, as far as the institutions are concerned, I mean, we were, since we are an academic hotspot, uh, we were very, very good at rallying forces and getting ahead of the curve. And uh, uh, at least at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, we have uh, the Shapiro Cardiovascular Center, which was actually built as a negative pressure building. So we have about uh, 140 odd beds in that center, which is which were all cardiovascular beds, but uh, we were all evicted out of that building and they were able to convert the whole building to a 140 bed ICU fairly right away. And the same thing happened at the general and between the two institutions we had, you know, uh, and, and our satellites, we had at least 500 patients in ICU at one given time. Um, again, being what we are, uh, we had more access to trials. So we had early access to uh, remdesivir and various other drugs that came up uh, in the management of uh, COVID-19. So we were lucky that way. Uh, we have a very robust uh, ECMO program at both institutions, so we had that available to our patients. And at one time, we had, a th I think, at least 10 patients on ECMO for, um, uh, for COVID-19. So in, from, from a management standpoint, I think we did really well inside the institution. And uh, we, were, we put almost everything on hold. Uh, uh, some, some specialties that went on long-term hold are uh, orthopedics, like joint replacements, et cetera. Uh, cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery went on hold. Things like cardiac surgery, cardiovascular medicine, interventions, et cetera, happened on an as-needed and emergent basis. Um, in New England, I'm proud to say that we were more uh, uh, more conforming to uh, directives than some of the other parts of the country, unfortunately. Uh, people were more compliant with social distancing, people were more compliant with mask wearing, and people were very careful in the way they behaved. And 
and that has led us to contain the disease in the Northeast a little better than, as you can see, what's going on in the West and uh, in the Southern part of the country. But between New York and Massachusetts, we had our share of troubles and uh, we had to put a lot of things on hold. And uh, I think fortunately, with a lot of care, we've been able to prevent adverse outcomes and um, at least among the patients that we know and, uh, and right through this pandemic. But the unfortunate thing that happened um, with COVID-19 is that a lot of people who had disease that were not seen stayed at home and, uh, and just sat on their heart attacks and sat on their appendicial perforations and sat on their gallbladder disease. And when they did show up, they were in rough shape. And there was some collateral damage because patients were not actually coming into the hospital. And at, at one point, all the academic centers in Massachusetts uh, actively um, went on public um, radio and television encouraging patients not to do that because we were seeing sort of an uptick in patients who were coming at the very end of their uh, disease conditions and becoming extremely high risk. So, uh, so that's been our experience in the Northeast and in the United States, as you know, we're coming up on about 150,000 mortalities and uh, uh, over a million and a half cases. So we are not a flagship of um, <laughs> how to do it right. But in some parts of the country, we have, uh, we have done it right. And, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we'll get to the other side of it sometime soon. All right, Prem, thanks very much for that. It's, uh, I think a lot of us here are just very interested in, in how other places are getting on. And we do see a lot of news of how bad things have been in the States. And, um, and it's really, really valuable just hearing someone who is uh, in, in the midst a bit so thanks very much for, for that we have run over a little bit but i think that just uh, i was happy to do so because it's been a fascinating presentation thank you very much um uh, and uh, and that's it for us so i just like to thank you again for for getting up early in the morning and presenting for us and uh, thanks to the audience for being here and we'll uh, if you missed any of that or you want to watch that gory video again this will be on youtube uh, later on today along with all our other grand rounds for the last uh, five or six years and I'll see you again next week. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom, for the invitation. And thank you all for um, being patient with the listening. And uh, hopefully my talk was of, much, of, of some value to all of you. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad I was able to do this. And uh, I thank you again. Thanks very much. Okay, then. Bye. Bye now.